you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 12. We are almost done, if we're re reading with us, with almost done with the Gospel of Luke. We'll finish it up this week, and next Lord's Day we'll start on the Gospel of John. So... Luke 12, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 34. It's one of the interesting passages because it all started with Jesus teaching on various topics and then a man kind of interrupted Christ and he asked the Lord to settle a personal issue. His parents or his father had passed away and now he and his siblings were arguing about the inheritance. Most likely it was the older brother who was keeping it all for himself. And maybe this was the younger brother coming to Christ and saying, Christ, hey, would you help me out here? Will you tell my brother to share this? To give me at least some of it. I need my portion. And that's a reasonable request it seems but what's strange is how the Lord responded back in verse 13 he he's basically gave him the cold shoulder it's like who am I who made me to be your judge or your arbiter I, I'm not worried about this and literally leaves it for himself to figure out I'm not going to help you here um, I mean that's strange to me I found that strange. And then after he kind of tells them, I'm not going to figure this out for you. He warns them and warns everybody about covetousness. And then goes and gives a sermon. It's kind of an impromptu sermon that was stimulated by this question. He turns and he's addressing the, the whole audience, the crowd, and gives them a sermon a lesson on finances he's giving them advice wealth management advice counsel how to view their possessions their resources and I, I can see at least seven major points that Christ gives for us to have wisdom in how we deal with our money. Um, seven principles, if you would, on how to manage your resources. Now, before we go into these seven resources or seven principles on how to manage your finances, uh, I pray that you're willing to listen to these counsel by God and say, I want to do these things. Now, don't hear Jeff Johnson. You're going to have to be a good Berean. He goes, this is what indeed Jesus preached. And if this is what he preached, Lord, help me to listen. I want to be changed by this counsel. I want my life to be affected. I don't want to just hear the word and not be a doer of the word. I want to listen and I want to obey. I want to, I want to be a good manager good steward of the resources God has given me and I also want you to think that you're not too poor to apply this to yourself or too young we think oh this is for the wealthy among us or this is for the older generation I, I wish my sons and my daughter would take heed to this and start applying it immediately not wait until you have a career if you have any resources which we all do it applies to us because if we're faithful with a little even if it's just a little God says you can be trusted with much so we want to be faithful with what we have and here are seven principles uh, that we want to apply and I also want us to run these principles through the grid of the gospel the fact that we don't buy our way into heaven that Christ who was rich became poor on our behalf and he set the example of how to live a life 
and how to manage his resources and view it through the gospel that we don't have to earn our way to heaven but we should apply this out of great gratitude for the, for the riches that Christ has already given us in Christ Jesus. So this should be done out of a heart. These principles should be done out of a motivation of love, not out of some moral obligation. And we don't want to apply this away and say if we are excelling in this area that we look down upon others who may struggle in this area. Remember the guy that came into the temple, he says, I have tithe everything I get. And he bragged in his tithing. And that's not uh, helpful. Uh, we don't actually know what the right hand is doing. But here are seven principles that I want to apply to myself. And I pray that you will see that this, these principles come from the very mouth of Jesus Christ. That he is going to instruct us on money and, and uh, though Christ is not worried about figuring out where the inheritance goes for this man he was worried about something more important and so don't mistake Christ as not being concerned about how you handle your pocketbook and how you divvy out your finances he's very much concerned because how you handle your money is a indicator of where your heart is it's an indicator of your love and your affection and God is very much worried about your affections and your love so let's apply these seven principles to our life and may the Lord use it to shape us and transform us because no matter where we're at on this grid or how well we already do these things we all know that we could do better first principle that Christ gives us is found in verse 13 and 14. If you're taking notes, write this down. Don't worry about being defrauded or cheated. In other words, don't allow your money to control you, but rather control your money. It's easy for your money to grip you and shape you and control you. But the Lord says we're to hold our wealth loosely we're stewards it's not actually ours and we don't need to be managed by our money but rather we need to manage our money don't allow the pursuit of wealth to drive you or to control you you say well I, I, Jeff I don't do that well put yourself under this test maybe you're already good at when you have a surplus and giving some out and helping out someone but how would you do you know if someone stole your inheritance you thought you were about to receive a windfall you know this money is about to come to you and you know and, and before your parents passed away or your father passed away you were you loved your siblings and we're not gonna fight about this you know it, it'll all work out we'll be just fine um, and, until you know a week after the funeral and your older brother or your older sister thinks all of it belongs to him or her then things change because you feel it's not just about not getting the money it feels I'm getting defrauded I'm getting cheated I'm I'm getting uh, what I what rightfully belongs to me it's being taken away and surely Christ cares about this surely Christ would stand on my side and he would defend me and he would go and tell my brother or my sister to share the inheritance we see that in verse 13 someone in the crowd said to him teacher tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me he just wanted things to be right but Jesus said this is not my concern look at verse 14 but he said to him man who made me a judge or arbiter over you why are you coming to me about this matter I mean if you want to be healed I'll heal you if you want to know the gospel I'll preach it to you but this is not why I'm here I'm not here to make sure you get your inheritance I'm not worried about that it, but it's as if the Lord is saying I am worried based upon the sermon he's about to preach I am worried about your heart I am worried about your issues 
of how you think about money. And he warns him and all those who are listening, be on your guard against covetousness. That is, I'm not worried about you getting all that you deserve in this life. I'm not worried about that. If you lose out, that's fine. I'm not too concerned. You'll be okay. But I am worried about you coveting your inheritance. I am worried about that. You see, it's not a sin to be cheated. But it is a sin to covet. And that takes me to the second principle. First principle is don't worry about being defrauded when it comes to the world's goods. Someone sues you, someone asks for your coat, your jacket, go ahead and give it to them. Don't worry about losing out in this world. Principle number one. Secondly, principle number two, don't covet. Don't covet. Be on guard, verse 15 says, against covetousness. Jesus said to them, take care. I mean, pay special attention. Uh, be mindful of this. Don't worry about getting your inheritance. Don't make that the focus of your thoughts, but rather focus on this. Take heed and be on your guard against all covetousness. Covetousness is a sin. It's, it's brought out of jealousy and greed. But really, it's a sign of discontentment and unhappiness. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 5.10, whoever loves money never has enough, and whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with income. You see, be on guard about discontentment. If you're not content with what you have right now, you wouldn't be content if you got your inheritance. If, you, if, you, if, if what you have is not enough, and I'll, I'll make this clear, all of us have enough. I mean, all of us are wealthy compared to the average person of the world, especially throughout history. You have enough. We have enough. We have enough. We have more than enough. We all really have surplus. We have extra. And we're not content with being so wealthy. Then we wouldn't be content if we had twice as much as what we have. The problem with covetousness is why we have to be on guard against it. It's one of the greatest of all sins. You say, oh, it's just a small sin. Everybody does it. No, it's a great sin because the Bible says covetousness is idolatry. Jesus put it this way. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So be careful that you don't covet after money. That that's not your passions of your heart's desires. You see, Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we cannot take anything out of this world. But if we have food and clothing, now that's all of us, we have that, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plague people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. The Puritan Thomas Brooks said, Solomon got good from his wealth, then he got good by his wisdom. Charles Spurgeon says, it's very difficult for a man to have much money running through his hands without some of it sticking. It's a very sticky stuff. And once it sticks to the hands, they are not clean in the sight of the Lord. Unless a man is able to use money without abusing it, accepting it as a talent lent to him and not as treasures given to him, it will very soon happen that the more money he has, the more troubles he will have. The reason we guard against covetousness, we see in verse 15, the end of verse 15, is because one's life 
does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. That is, God made you for a purpose. He designed you. He crafted you for his glory. He did not make you simply so you can gather possessions. Your life doesn't consist of how much stuff you have. Hebrews 13, 15 says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I've never deserted you, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. You see, wealth, your clothing, your car, your vehicle, your home, that doesn't determine your value. Your value Now, man may value that and deem you more valuable in their eyes, but God, he doesn't look upon a man and look at the outward appearance, and he doesn't look at the the possessions and think, oh, this one's more important than another. Our value is not determined by our wealth. We are not born to simply gather an abundance of possessions so that's the second principle that Christ gives us guard against covetousness the third principle in his sermon he gives this illustration he gives this kind of a a parable or or story to, to tell us not to hoard our possessions we see this in verse 16 through 21 and he told them a parable saying The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. I mean, you can retire, relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is one who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Now this is odd financial advice. Counterintuitive. This is not what you're going to hear when you go sit down at the desk at Edward Jones. They're not going to give you an illustration like this one. In fact, it's strange because, I mean, he's had bumper crops. What's he supposed to do? I mean, he's going to let the crops rot? Is he going to just say, hey, I just can't, oh, I mean, I can't reap all this. I, I just need to let it go to waste. I mean, what is he supposed to do? Is it not good counsel to make good investments and use your wealth to turn it over to build more wealth? And maybe this guy was on the verge of having enough for retirement, but with this bumper crops, he could settle the matter and and have all that he needed to retire upon. Now, isn't that good counsel? Why did Christ call this man a fool when everybody else would say he was wise? Why, Why is he a fool? Because he thought of himself and not of God he was rich towards himself and not rich towards God he didn't go well I have more than enough how can I help the poor he thought how can I enrich myself even the more he put his desires upon himself in this life and not in the life to come this is a poor investment indeed Remember, death ends your retirement fund. We gather and gather and gather. We may build bigger and bigger barns. But for what? For what? Before dying at the age of 40 from stomach cancer, the world-famous designer and author, Krista Rodriguez wrote on her social media account these words. I mean, this is days before her death. 
I had the most expensive car in the world in my garage, but now I have to use a wheelchair. She's 40 years old when she wrote this. In my house, there are all kinds of branded clothes, shoes, and valuables, but now my body is wrapped in a small cloth provided by the hospital. I got plenty of money in the bank, but now I'm benefiting from, I'm not benefiting from that amount. My house was like a castle, but now I'm sleeping on two beds in the hospital. From five-star hotel to now spending time in hospitals, moving from clinic to clinic. I've been to seven barbers to get my hair done, but now I don't have a hair on my head. With a private jet, I can fly anywhere, but, I, but now I need two assistants to walk to the hospital gate. Although there are many foods, now my diet is two tablets a day and a few drops of salt water at night. This house, this car, this plane, this fortune, this bank, this excessive fame and glory, none of these things are useful to me. None of this will relax me. There is nothing real except death. You fool. Jesus would say to someone like this you've gathered this all up and this day your soul is required of you now who's wiser I've heard of two different men one man was very wealthy in a city not too far from here I just heard this last week that in his office is a secret room and if you go into that secret room, now I haven't seen it, but I heard about it. You go in the secret room behind his desk or somewhere in his office, it's full of guns and stacks of cash and stacks of gold. He's prepared. He, he has what he needs for the zombie apocalypse that's to come. I heard of another wealthy man. In fact, I know of another wealthy man that gave so much away that he had to push back his retirement and work longer because he gave so much of away. You know John Calvin, John Wesley, and Charles Spurgeon all died poor men. John Wesley died a pauper with no more than equivalent to today's economy, $2,000 in his account. When he had over $6 million that he gave away, built Methodist churches around Britain. Charles Spurgeon died with just a little over $100,000 in today's equivalent funds. He died with just a little over a hundred thousand dollars. Well, that's a pretty good stash. Well, not when you consider that he gave away twenty-six million dollars. He built the Metropolitan Tabernacle almost himself with his own funds. He didn't take a salary from the church. He made so much money through the book sales that he funded orphanages in his own college and gave it all away. He was a steward of money that come to him and he would pass it on for the calls of God. Now he died with nothing. In fact, many men die with nothing. And you have some men that die with a fortune. Tell yourself, ask yourself, which is wiser? So this is the third principle that Christ is giving. Don't hoard your wealth. Don't just collect it just for yourself. The fourth principle that he gives us, we see in verse 21. Honor God with your wealth. We see this in verse 21. So is the one who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. The fool is the one who's thinking about himself the wise man is the one who's thinking about God, is rich not towards self, but rich towards God. 
You see, when it comes to our money, our first priority, our first priority should be the Lord. You know, we get some money, what should we think first? Not second or third or down the list, or hopefully if I have a little left over, I'll, I'll help God out or I'll give to God or honor God. No, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 8:18, 8, remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And then Solomon said in Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with your wealth and from the first of all your increase. My, my grandfather, my mother tells me, has told me, was take his paycheck, cash it, and he would take the percentage out of it that he was going to give the first percentage out of it. First thing he would do is take that out in the cash and he'd put it in a secret spot in his wallet so on Sunday he could take that out of that secret spot and put it in the offering plate. And one particular cold day, my mother being a twin, said the twins needed new jackets. And my gr grandmother suggested to my grandfather, well, here we have the money in this, you know, you have some money set aside, we could pay the Lord back later. Not necessarily steal it from the Lord, but pay that back later, we need the jackets today. And my grandfather stood his ground and says, no, I've already given that to the Lord. And they leave town and come home without jackets to only find two jackets in the mail. Do you not realize keeping your wealth is robbing God? Does not know what Malachi 3 8 tells us? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, How have we robbed you in your tithes and offerings? He goes on to say, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and therefore put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you blessings until there is no more need. Has God not promised you and I that if we give generously, he will generously bless us? Does not Proverbs eleven twenty four 24 says, There is one who scatters yet increases all the more, and there is one who withholds what is justly due, and yet it results only in want? Spurgeon says many people will always be poor because they never give to the cause of God. Proverbs 22, 9 says, Whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed, for he shares his bread with the poor. Spurgeon says God has a way of giving by cartloads to those who give away with shovelfuls. Jesus put it this way in Luke 6, 38. If you give, you will get. Your gift will return to you in full, an overflowing measure, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more and running over. Whatever measure you use to give, large or small, will be used to measure what is given back to you. I, I, I don't know if we believe that. I, I have a hard time believing that as evidence by my giving little. Proverbs 3, 9 tells us, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Proverbs eleven twenty five: 25, A generous soul will prosper, and he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. He said, well, that's Old Testament. Well, here's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for Food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. And what Paul is saying, the more you give, the more God will give you to give. 
the, the, the goal is not I'm going to give so I can build wealth for myself. That's not the heart and the issue here. The more it flows out of you, more will flow into you to continue to flow out to you. You could be a, a conduit of giving more and more to the Lord by just stretching what you, you and I already give. You see, this is the fourth principle. According to Christ, we're to honor the Lord with our wealth, to be rich towards God. Fifth principle we see in verse 22. Don't focus or make it your aim or don't be anxious or overly concerned with becoming wealthy. He said in verse 22, and he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you put on it. Proverbs 24, 4 says, Do not toll to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. John 6, 27, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. 1 Timothy 6, 9, Those who want to be rich, fall into temptation and become ensnared by many foolish and harmful desires that plague them into ruin and destruction. Don't make it your life focus to be wealthy. Don't teach your kids, Christian parents, don't teach your kids that being successful means being wealthy. That's not what we're here for. It's not the purpose of life. And we're not to be anxious about this. And real quickly, I know you're going to go, what? There's six reasons why not to be anxious about money. So there's seven principles. There's six reasons not to be anxious or overly concerned about principles. Let's run through these six real quick. First, verse 23, because you were not created to build wealth. Look, look at 23. For life is more than food and body is more than clothing. You think Jesus, when he came and lived among us, he goes, hey, I just got to have all the designer clothes and I got to have all this wealth and I need all this stuff. You know, why did he say foxes have homes and birds have places to, to live in, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head? Why would, he didn't have anything. And you may think to yourself, well, that's because Christ knew he had a, a purpose greater than all that. Well, do you not have a purpose greater than all that? Well, that's because Christ knew he's going to die young. I mean, he didn't need a retirement. He's, he knew he's going to die at an early age. Well, who says you're going to live that long? Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're going to make it past your 30s. You're going to live into your 60s. Okay. Okay. That's a long time. Oh, wait, no, you'll make it into your 90s. In the scheme of all eternity, that's just a long time. You see, we're not here but for a moment. We're pilgrims. We're passing through this world. It's not about, you know, I'm in a tent, you know, and I've got to hang the Mona Lisa up in my tent. No, we're just passing by. We're not here to collect the stuff. We're not here to build bigger barns. We're here to serve Christ and use our resources for his kingdom. At least this seems to be what Christ is telling us. Second reason not to be overly anxious and building wealth, we see in verse 24. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn. Yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than the birds? It's like, well, you know, I need a big pantry, and I need multiple deep freezes, and I need uh, security. I need a retirement fund. Well, consider the birds. They're not worried about that. Charles Spurgeon talks about, uh, in fact, there's an American who is visiting Spurgeon, and they were driving in a carriage, and Spurgeon looked out the window and said, hey, there's my bank. And the American looked out the window and says, what bank? I don't see a bank. All there was was just a little plaque. And the plaque read two words, Jehovah Jireh. 
my God supplies. He says, that is the bank I depend upon for my orphanages. Why do we worry about such matters when God has already given you and I a promise? I feed the birds. I clothe the lilies of the valley. I'm going to take care of your needs. And the reason we may worry about it is we know we're going to have food in our stomach and clothes on our body but we're worried about our standard of living we may not have the standard of living that we would want it says don't worry about this the third reason not to worry we see in verse 25 and 26 is because anxiety and worry and concern is just a waste of time verse 25 and which of you being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life if then you're not able to do as small a thing as that why are you anxious about the rest why are you worried about the stock market if the there's going to be a recession or not why are you worried about these matters uh, your anxiety doesn't change a thing I hear report after report people says you know I watched Fox News for so long and I realize that all it does is make me anxious and nothing changes now that I've turned off the television, I'm happier. Well, don't, I mean, this is a wonderful promise that God says to all his children. You seek first the kingdom of God and I'll take care of this. But you see, fourthly, why we're not to be anxious, when we are anxious about tomorrow and about our future and about our retirement and about security, it shows that we don't have faith or we lack faith look at verse 27 consider the lilies how they grow they neither toll nor span yet I tell you even Solomon all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these but if God so clothes the grass which is alive in the field today and tomorrow it is thrown into the oven how much more will he clothe you oh you of little faith you see are you worried about the down economy the falling value of the dollar, the real possibility of recession? Are you worried about the future of your financial stability? And maybe you're not giving, or you can't give as much, or you're worried about giving because you're worried about all these things. What does Jesus say? Oh, you have little faith. Fifth, don't be anxious because all that does is take your focus off the kingdom of God. You see, unbelievers are the ones that give their attention and their worry to financial security and matters of that, matters of wealth. Verse 29, and do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things. That's what they worry about. But second, God already knows you need these things. It says, and your father knows that you need them. He knows what you need. He's got you. He's promised to take care of you. Rather, when we're worried about this, it keeps us from worrying about what God does want us to be worried about, and that is his kingdom, his mission. Verse 31, instead seek the kingdom, his kingdom, and these will be added to you. You know, you go, front on, you go work on the front lines, battle in the, in the war, fight, God says, if you're fighting on the front line, I'm going to keep the supply chain coming to you. I'll keep you fed. I'll keep you clothed. You just worry about fighting. You worry about why you're here and do that. Six is one of the most, this is the last reason not to be anxious, and it's the most glorious. You're already rich as can be. <laughs> why are you worried about becoming wealthy when you're already filthy, rich look at verse 32 fear not don't be anxious about what you're going to eat or drink little flock for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom i mean god says i'm going to give you everything you're going to have wealth untold i'm going to give you all of it i'm going to, i've already made you joint heirs with christ you're a brother and sister with the lord you're the you're a son and daughter of god 
it's an argument from the greater to the lesser. If he's going to give you the world, if he's going to give you riches, he's going to give you eternal life and heaven and everything you can imagine, is he not going to make sure you have food and clothing? So don't worry, little flock. It is God's good pleasure to give you everything. So this is the fifth principle that Christ gives us about wealth. Don't be overly focused on it. Six. Oh, this, is, this one's good. This is, this is where it gets very practical. According to Christ, exchange God's wealth that is what you merely steward because none of you own anything in this life you know you're just stewards you know you, you own nothing we're, hey we're all on the same playing field we're all equally broke now we have the the joint heirs with Christ and we're gonna have everything given to us but in this life we're, we have nothing we'll keep nothing we're just stewards of of God's talents and God's wealth. And so we're to uh, steward it well. We're to take what doesn't belong to us and exchange it for possessions that will never be taken away from us. Now, he starts by giving us the craziest of all the counsel. You thought, you know, the counsel of of this story about uh, a guy that wanted to invest his crops and build bigger barns was crazy. This is definitely not what we do, you would hear from Edward Jones or even so much from any financial advisor. You worried about you worried about tomorrow? Do this: sell your possessions. <laughs> And I want my inheritance. Hey, I'm not worried about your inheritance. If you get it, or don't get it. But I'll tell you this, you should sell what you have. Look at verse 33. Sell your possessions. What kind of counsel is this? Liquidate. Liquidate. Not build bigger barns. How about decreasing? That, that seems so counterintuitive. What, what, what do you do with if you decrease, sell your stuff and do what? Give to the needy. Give to those who don't have as much. Now, you might want to think of this counsel as hyperbole. You know, when Jesus says, if your hand offends you, cut it off. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. You know, oh, that's hyperbole. Well, maybe this is a hyperbole. Sell your possessions. You know, we'd like for that to be hyperbole, so I don't plan on selling anything. You know, I don't want to sell anything. And remember, this is not a command. This is counsel. This is, I'm not here saying you, all of us need to start selling our stuff. This is, this is just counsel. In fact, it's wise counsel. When you think of eternity, it's wise. Because this is what he says. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. And this is why. why? Provide yourself with money bags. <laughs> Some translations, purses. And other translations says treasures in heaven. I mean, sell what you have and, and get real wealth. Uh, teaching us, exchange what really doesn't belong to you. For things that will belong to you. Nothing we have is eternal. We brought nothing in this world. We're going to carry absolutely nothing out of this world. Nothing. Everything we do own is waxing old. I mean, everything is in the long run. I like to think that I have some things that I appreciate and value. I mean, I think my house is appreciating in value, especially with inflation. But, and ultimately, you take enough time, you know, I just think about enough time going by, my house is going to depreciate eventually. In fact, everything is going to wax old. Why not take what doesn't belong to us 
and exchange it for something that can never be taken away from us. This is what it says. Jesus says, provide for yourself money bags that do not grow old with treasures in the heavens that do not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. I think this is the lesson of the unjust steward. The unjust steward is another parable that Jesus says uh, that gives a couple chapters later. And, he, and the unjust steward is, is a man that knows he's going to lose his job. And he takes what doesn't belong to him, unjustly, by the way, and forgives everybody's debt so that he can secure himself a better future, a job, when he loses his job. Now, Christ is not commending the unjustness of those actions. That's pretty sinful behavior. But he is commending the person taking what doesn't belong to him and securing a better future, and that's pretty wise. And he says the children of this world are wiser than the children of the kingdom. Luke 16, Jesus says, For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, as all money will fail, they may receive you in, into eternal dwelling. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you to true riches, those real money bags? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is why Jim Elliott says, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. That is... It's no foolish, no foolishness. That is wise. If we were wise, now this is not commands. We're not going to go around and see if you sold your possessions or how much money you're giving. But if we were wise, we would be generous. We would stretch ourselves. Um, uh, over the years, I've tried to collect various things that I think appreciate and value. And um, so you take $500 every now and then and, and take it from the, the cash to put it into some physical object, precious stones or precious, actually, metals. And um, so you put in buying silver here. I wish I could afford gold, but I can't. So I buy a little silver here, hopefully buy a little silver there. And you do it in a way you never, lose, you never miss the money, right? It's like, well, I, I wasn't going to miss that hundred dollars, uh, five hundred dollars. I'm just, as it's it's kind of collecting there, I'll just kind of transfer it there. Then, the silver just hopefully grows. You know, that sounds pretty cool and all, but I thought to myself, how much wiser it would have been for all the money I put in silver to have put it in to the church coffers or to give to the needy, to give to the poor. You know, if we, if, you know, that money, if you just, just kind of let it shovel over to the kingdom of God and to the needs that you see. I mean, you say, well, I'll, 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 I'm going to miss that. I need that money. Do you know how long forever is? And I don't understand what money bags are in heaven. I don't understand what treasures in heaven are. I don't understand that. But what we can't keep turns into that which we cannot lose. Oh, if we would just follow Christ's counsel, we would be wise. This brings me to the last piece of counsel found in verse 34. When we're bringing this sermon to a conclusion here. And I think this is the heart of the whole matter. He ends his sermon with kind of getting to the heart of the issue. Because this is not about the value amount of what we give or, or we can afford to give. This is nothing about if it's $10 or $10 billion. It's, that's not the issue. It's the heart that Christ is worried about. And so the seventh and final principle that Christ gives us is place your affections on things above. Verse 34 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. 
You see, this is a heart issue. Where you spend your money is the biggest indicator, or one of the biggest indicators, that in your time, which is your resources. Where you spend your time and money is the indication of where your heart is. You can look back over your life and kind of evaluate your checkbook. I mean, I don't have a checkbook. Those are long gone for anybody my age or younger. Um, but you could go back and look at your bank account and evaluate how you spent your money over the years and you can see your affections change when you're small kids you, you had a little extra money you go to Walmart and buy toys so toys was where your hearts were located then it goes when you're teenagers you buy start buying clothes then you get older older almost in your 20s you start thinking about your cars and vehicles and the, you, you put all your money in that and then finally you get a little bit wiser you start thinking about your homes and your houses and then after you get a house, you think, well, maybe I need more land. And you start buying land or build your business a little bit more. And so your, your, your heart and your affections are changing. And, and you get older, you're like, well, I'm not too worried about clothes anymore. That's, i got to have clothes to, you know, kind of like, hopefully you get a point where it's like, it's not about what I wear. It's, it's not indication of my wealth or my status. You know, I need to actually spend my money more wisely. And, and you start seeing things shift. And you so then it, when you, you get my age and older you start well I gotta start thinking about retirement I wish I would have thought about that when I was younger and but now I'm thinking about it a little too late you know and you start thinking about that and it's only on your deathbed that you start thinking about laying up treasures in heaven and we shouldn't wait you know you hear people that they're on their deathbed and they've collected all this wealth and they disperse it not throughout their life they wait till they're about dead when they realize I don't need this anymore my kids don't need it in fact I want my kids to have it and then they start thinking about how can I prepare myself treasures in heaven I hear about that quite a bit in fact I know one guy that built two churches because he thought he was gonna die and then he started going to church got diagnosed and terminal cancer he thought he's gonna die and he gave a lot of money to the church they built a new church and then he got better he didn't die so he quit going to church you know it's like like yeah you get right on your death but now let me think about the next life but see I, I want you kids children the smallest of us don't wait till you're you have a career to start thinking I need to give to the Lord if you have an allowance even if it's a dollar a week or a dollar a month how do I honor the Lord with that how do I how do I invest for all eternity with what I have if you can be faithful with just a little God might give you a, a raise in your allowance so that you can be more generous and more because uh, you know where you spend your money is going to be where your heart is and the reason we're we're buying all this stuff you know we buy it, yard sales and storage sheds tell us that we buy too much stuff that we really don't need or want what a shame I mean let's rebuke myself what a shame that we have surplus of stuff and we just buy more stuff and or what a shame you know it's like well I don't waste my money what a shame if you just put it in the bank seriously if you're just collecting so you can die what a shame put your heart not in this world you see don't put your heart in this life this is not the life that we're seeking this is world is not our home this is not uh, where our love should be but, you know where your love is think about Christ and his cause and his purposes his kingdom uh, think about heaven you know if that is where your affections are that's where you're going to put your treasures where your treasure is that's where your heart is and if your heart is on Christ it'll be easy to give it'll be easy Colossians tells us if then you've been raised with Christ seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God set your minds and your affections on things that are above not on the things of the earth you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God when Christ who is your life appears then then you will appear with him in glory that is what we're shooting for eternity so lay up treasures in heaven and the more we give to God the more our affections will rise up
towards God. Closing. Children start now, poor people, as if there were poor among us. But there are poor people. I mean, there, there are some of us, like myself, you, some of us are, are on the lower end of things, maybe. This applies to us. Remember the widower who gave a mite. Don't think, oh, this applies to the wealthy. This applies to all of us. Remember, as I started this, this functions out of the gospel. We don't earn our way to heaven. We don't buy our way to heaven. This is not uh, something we have said. If we failed, we know the gospel forgives us, and we've been unwise. And we have motivation out of the love of Christ to give. So maybe the Lord help us look at these seven principles and say, this is an amazing sermon or counsel. This is, if you would, financial counsel from the book. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are thankful that Christ moment to instruct us how to view our money, how to view our possessions. Lord, increase our faith in eternity in your word, in your promises. And use us as conduits, as good stewards of the wealth that you have invested or you have uh, temporarily given us to steward. For this we pray for your namesake. Amen.